In this video, we discuss the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of f with respect to t. We will um, do the proof or the derivation of the formula in the theorem for that. And then once we know the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of a function, we will use that and everything that we learned previously about the Laplace transform to solve an initial value problem. Um, that's typically what we use the Laplace transformation for is to solve initial value problems where the initial conditions are specified at t equals zero. We're going to focus on the case where the differential equation has constant coefficients this time. Later, we will look at the case where the differential equation has variable coefficients. So here's our theorem. It says that if f, f prime, all the way up to the n minus one derivative of f are continuous on any interval of the form, um, t between zero and b inclusive, and all of those functions satisfy um, this inequality. So what that means is that they are of exponential order. And I guess I should specify that this is satisfied for k equals zero through n minus one. So they're all of exponential order, um, but it's, it's important to note that they're of exponential order for the same positive constants, m and c and t. So m and c are positive, so that means this is just an exponential function, that's e to a constant times t, multiplied by an extra scalar, a positive scalar, so it's just stretching it vertically a little bit. It's just gonna have that, uh, can have that shape that we're all accustomed to for the shape of exponential functions. It's going to look like that, basically. And again, remember what this says. This says that eventually, for all t greater than some particular t, um, this function is less than this exponential function. So we're saying that this function, this exponential, outpaces this exponent, or this function, not an exponential, um, this. Uh, function the kth derivative of f with respect to t for these values of k eventually. Um, so that's what it means for a function to be of exponential order. So they're all of exponential order for the um, same exponential function over here and for the same time interval. If that's true and the nth derivative of f with respect to t is piecewise continuous on the interval from zero to b, then the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of f exists for all s greater than c, where c is the exponential order of all of those functions. And in that case, the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of f with respect to t is given by this. Now that looks like a lot, but there's actually a pattern there. It can be a little bit difficult to see at first, but if this is the nth derivative, we're starting with s to the n here. And it turns out that if this is the nth derivative, there are going to be n plus one terms. Every term starts with s to some power and the powers of s decrease. So we've got s to the n, s to the n minus one, s to the n minus two, eventually we'll have s to the first. And then the last one, there's no s, that's an s to the zero. So these um, form n terms and then the s to the zero term gives us n minus one terms. The first term is positive. The sec are all the remaining terms start with a negative sign. And then all of those powers of S are multiplied by functions or functions or, or particular values of a function. The first one is multiplied by the Laplace transform of f of t. So that is denoted by capital F of s, or I'll just call it big F of s. And then multiplying all of the other powers of s over here are that function little f evaluated at zero and little f's derivatives evaluated at zero. And as you go from left to right, for each of those terms, the derivatives increase. So we're gonna have f of zero, f prime of zero, f double prime of zero. Eventually we're gonna have f to the, or not to the n minus two, the n minus second derivative of f evaluated at zero. And then the last one will be the n minus one derivative at zero. 
So this derivative evaluated at zero is gonna be one less than the order of this derivative. So if this is uh, F triple prime, this is going to be F double prime evaluated at zero. So that's how that works. But again, these conditions need to be satisfied. So all of our functions um, or F through the N minus one derivative need to be continuous on the interval from zero to B. And all of those functions need to be of exponential order for the same exponential function here for the same time interval. And this is our third condition. The nth derivative, that's this function that we're taking the Laplace transform of, has to be piecewise continuous on the interval from zero to b. And again, remember what that means. It just means it's continuous in pieces. But when we say it's continuous in pieces, any point of discontinuity has to be either a jump discontinuity or a removable discontinuity. So what we mean is the limit from the left and the limit from the right for each of those points of discontinuity has to be a finite number. If it's an infinite discontinuity or an oscillating discontinuity, it's not piecewise continuous. Okay, so if all three of these conditions are satisfied, then we're guaranteed that the Laplace transform of the derivative exists for all s greater than c, where c is that constant multiplying the t. We say that these functions are all of exponential order c, and it's, it's that value of c. That's right there. Okay, let's prove this. To prove this, we're just going to use, um, well, I'm actually not gonna prove it exactly, um, but I'm going to uh, go through the derivation a little bit. So it's kind of proof, proofy, it's not exactly a proof. We're just gonna start with n equals one and show that this is true for n equals one. And I'm going to look at a special case. Here, I'm just going to assume that f prime of t is continuous. Now, if f prime of t were piecewise continuous, um, as is stated right here, we could change the derivation or the proof just a little bit. I'm not going to worry about that in this video, though. We're just going to look at the special case when f prime is continuous. OK, so I want to show that if these three conditions are satisfied, then the Laplace transform of the first derivative of f with respect to t will exist for all s greater than c. And the Laplace transform of the derivative will have this form. Um, and this will be n equals 1 um, because we're taking, taking the first derivative. So we'll have two terms over here. So we're going to have s to the first times the Laplace transform of f minus um, little f at zero, and that's going to be it. It's just going to be two terms because our, our n is equal to one. So we'll start with that. And here we are assuming all of these things are true. So we're assuming that f and f prime are continuous or actually for n equals one, we just need to assume that f is continuous. On the interval from zero to b for any value of b. So any positive real value of b. And we're assuming that f is of exponential order. And the exponential order in this case, it's exponential order C. And we're going to use all of these same constants. So I'm not going to write it again, but I'm talking about these constants there. And then we are looking at the special case when F prime is piece or not piecewise continuous, but continuous on the interval from zero to B. So we're assuming this and this, and we're assuming that um, F prime is continuous. Well, then. Well, let's just, I'll just write that here. Basically, whenever you do a proof and they're trying to say that if this is true, then this is true, you get to assume the if part. And all you need to do is show that if this is true, provided that we can assume this part, we actually get this part. Um, so we're going to 
to go on from here and talk about the Laplace transform of F prime of T. And our hope is that these conditions are going to be enough that we can show that um, F prime of T has this, or the Laplace transform of F prime of T has this form. So we assume that, and now we're examining the Laplace transform of F prime. Now, I would just start with the definition. So we're assuming all of this is true. Then the Laplace transform of F prime is equal to this. Just by definition, it's the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times f prime of t dt. Now, what I'm trying to show is that this Laplace transform actually looks like this. So I'm trying to get a Laplace transform of f of t over on this side somewhere. In order to get an, a Laplace transform of f of t on this side somewhere, I wanna write this as e to the negative st times f of t somehow. Well, I can do that if I use integration by parts. Um, but first, since it's an improper integral, it's always a good idea to write the improper integral as a limit. Since the upper limit is infinity, this is actually the limit as v goes to infinity of this guy, of the integral from zero to b of e to the negative st times f prime of t dt. And then I want to evaluate this, but I want to rewrite it in such a way that I have an e to the negative st times f, f of t rather than f prime. Well, in order to do that, I'll just use integration by parts. Remember how that works. Part of this is u, everything else is dv. And I want an f of t, so I'm going to make dv f prime of dt dt. And that means my u is the exponential. So this is the integral of u dv. By integration by parts, the integral of u dv is uv minus the integral of v du. So we need to compute v and we need to compute du. Well, the antiderivative of the derivative is the original function plus c, but we ignore the plus c whenever we do integration by parts. And then the derivative of e to some power is e to that power times the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. The derivative of the inside with respect to t is just this constant that's multiplying t. So we have a negative s there, and then we have a dt there. So then according to integration by parts, we have the limit as v goes to infinity of u times v minus the integral of v du, where u times v is evaluated on the interval from zero to b. And um, this integral of v du is also um, from zero to b. So we're just going to do that over here. And I'm still bringing my limit as v goes to infinity along. I'll do that later. So u times v evaluated from zero to b minus the integral of v du. Now, negative s is a constant with respect to t, so I can pull that out of my integral. And look, now I've got the integral uh, for the original Laplace transform. Now, if you're saying that's not the Laplace transform, it's almost there, but that's supposed to be an infinity. Well, remember, we're taking the limit as b goes to infinity of this. So when we take the limit as b goes to infinity of this, that is exactly the Laplace transform of f of t. So that's our f of s, which we want from our formula over there. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, just applying the fundamental theorem of calculus, I'll plug in b here. And then substitute zero and subtract. That's e to the zero, which is one times f of zero. Okay, and now I have an s to the first times something that as b goes to infinity, that's going to be the Laplace transform of f, and I have minus f of zero. It's actually the form that we want. The only thing that's a little bit questionable here is this little piece. We say, okay, well, what's the limit of this? Well, the limit of this piece is the Laplace transform. The limit of the constant is just the constant. 
Um, but this, well, it really depends. It depends on the properties of f of b and, it, and how that relates to this exponential function, e to the negative s times b. Well, if s is positive, this is e to a large negative power as b goes to infinity. So this is approaching zero. And the question is like, does the whole thing approach zero? Can we guarantee the whole thing approaches zero? Well, um, we can because of these assumptions right here. We assume that F is continuous, that doesn't help us. But we also assume that F is of exponential order C and F prime is continuous. And when we say exponential order C, what we mean is that for some positive constants M and C, the um, absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to m times e to the c times t for all t greater than some t. Okay, with that in mind, we have this. Let's say, since f is of exponential order c, we can say the following. The absolute value of f of b is less than or equal to m times e to the c times b. And that's true because um, I'm evaluating this at t equals b. Now this is for all b greater than capital T b is going to infinity. So eventually this is going to be true. Eventually b will be greater than capital T. So we have this. Now I wanna take this and I wanna multiply by this exponential function. And since that exponential function is always positive, we have this. I wish I had done that in a different color. I'm multiplying by that here and I'm multiplying by it, the same thing over here. This is true again for all b greater than t. And now what I'm getting is a, a bound for uh, this guy as b goes to infinity or for all b greater than uh, capital T. Well, this will always be less than this and I can rewrite this expression um, we've got e to some power times e to a different power. You just add the exponents. And I think I'll factor out an, a negative one and factor out the b. And then we have this. That's equivalent. So what we're saying is for all b greater than t, this guy is always less than this guy, but as b goes to infinity, this guy is going to approach zero as long as s minus c is positive. And s minus c is positive uh, when s is greater than c. So we'll say since f is of exponential order c, all these inequalities are true. Therefore, um, e to the negative sb times f of b will approach zero. And I guess that's because m times e to the negative um, s minus c times b is approaching zero. As b goes to infinity, provided that s is greater than c, so that we've got e to a large negative power as b goes to infinity. So the fact that f was of exponential order was enough to show, or was enough to um, get us to the point where we could show that this guy approaches zero. And then the limit of this, well, the limit of a constant as b goes to infinity is just the constant. And then we've got s, which is just a constant as far as we're concerned as b goes to infinity and the limit as b goes to infinity of this piece is f of s. So I have s times f of s minus f of zero. All right, great. So we have shown that the Laplace transform of the first derivative is equal to 
s to the first minus or times the Laplace transform of little f of t minus little f at zero, which is exactly what we would have over here. According to this formula, um, we have the nth derivative here. Um, I should have two terms. And the first term is an s to the first term. The next one is an s to the zero term. And then I have the Laplace transform here. And then I have a minus f of zero there. And that's exactly what we got. Now let's see what would happen if n is equal to two. And this is what we've shown so far. The Laplace transform of f prime is equal to s times f of s minus little f at zero. Well, in that case, I guess we should say for uh, s greater than c. Let's see what happens when n is equal to two. Well, if I want to take the Laplace transform of f double prime, I can actually think of that um, as a special case of this. This is the Laplace transform of f prime prime. So rather than having um, the Laplace transform of f of t right here, because that's what that is, and a little f at zero, I can have the Laplace transform of f prime right here and f prime at zero. So making that substitution, we have s times the Laplace transform of f prime minus f prime at zero. And I want you to see the substitution that I'm making. I'm replacing this f of t with f prime and I'm replacing this f with f prime as well. Okay, well, the Laplace transform of f prime, that whole piece can be replaced by this. And so we're gonna have s times s f of s minus f of zero minus this f prime at zero. And so we end up with s squared times f of s minus s f of zero minus f prime at zero. And that's exactly what our formula says. And I guess we should have made some assumptions here as well. This is assuming that, well, I guess we're assuming that um, f double prime is continuous. Uh, but if we were assuming that f double prime is piecewise continuous, we would have to like, worry about all of those little pieces. And actually when you add them all together, it's gonna be fine anyway. Um, but provided that f prime is continuous, um, then this works. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, this shows that the Laplace transform of the second derivative starts with s squared, then we have an s to the first, then we have an s to the zero. Then we multiply all of those guys by um, the Laplace transform of little f, and then we have f of zero and f prime of zero. So we start with the Laplace transform and the derivatives, the order of the derivatives increase Let's do one more. I think we, you guys can see the pattern. I want the Laplace transform of uh, F triple prime. That's the Laplace transform of, let's see, do, how do I wanna think of this? So I wanna think of this as the Laplace transform of F prime double prime. Yes, I think I do. No, I wanna do, I want to think of it that way. That's the way I want to think of it. Like, well, would it be helpful to put the second derivative here, or the second derivative here is what I'm wondering. I think I want to put the second derivative here. Okay. So now I'm going to go back up here again, but instead of having the Laplace transform of f of t and f of zero, I'm going to have the Laplace transform um, of f prime and then an f prime of zero. No, wait. I'm like, what's playing the role of f? Oh yeah, the what's playing the role of f in this case is f double prime. So according to this, just applying it here, we have s times the Laplace transform of f double prime and then rather than having f of zero, 
we're going to evaluate that at, or we're going to have f double prime, excuse me, evaluated at zero. Okay. And now we already know the Laplace transform of f double prime from right there. And so we get this, that s squared times f of s minus s times f of zero minus f prime at zero. And then we're subtracting f double prime at zero. And if we distribute that s, this is what we get. We can see how the pattern is evolving. If we just keep going back to this first case when n is equal to one, we see that for the second derivative, we have s to the second, s to the zero, or s to the first, and then an s to the zero. Then we have the Laplace transform of f, and f of zero and f prime of zero. For the third derivative, we've got s to the third, and s squared, s to the first, and s to the zero. Then we've got the Laplace transform, and then the order of the derivatives increase, and we're talking about little f evaluated at zero. Okay, so I think we can see that in general, the Laplace transform of the nth derivative of f with respect to t is s to the n times f of s minus s to the n minus one times f of zero minus s to the n minus two times f prime at zero and so on and eventually we get to the n minus one derivative of the function at zero notice when this is a third derivative this is uh, f double prime when this is a second derivative that was f prime so if this is the nth derivative that's um, the n minus one derivative evaluated at zero Okay, so now that we've proven that, we can use this and everything else that we've previously learned about the Laplace transform to solve initial value problems. Now, let's, let's write down some of the Laplace transforms that we know, those that we've committed to memory because they just come up so often. The Laplace transform of one is one over S. The Laplace transform of E to the AT is one over S minus A. The Laplace transform of t to the n is n factorial over s, oops, s to the n plus one. The Laplace transform of hyperbolic sine, oops, of kt and hyperbolic cosine of kt are given by k over s squared minus k squared and s over s squared minus k squared. And the Laplace transform of sine of kt and cosine of kt are similar. Oops. They've got a k in the numerator for the sine and the hyperbolic sine. We've got an s in the numerator for the hyperbolic cosine and the cosine. But for the sine and cosine functions, rather than having an s squared minus k squared, we end up with s squared plus k squared. And we derived all of these formulas. We actually used this one and the linearity properties to divide, um, derive these two. And then we used the definition to derive this one. And then I actually skipped this one. And I said, the de derivation of this one is very similar to the derivation of that one. But we got these seven um, Laplace transforms, and now we also know the Laplace transform of the nth derivative. And you can see that if you know f of zero, f prime of zero, f double prime of zero, all the way up to the n minus one derivative at zero, as we do when we have an initial value problem with initial conditions all specified at zero, this, whenever we take the Laplace transform of a derivative, it's just going to be this algebraic expression involving f of s and constants times powers of s. Um, so this, this means, because we know this, um, we're going to be able to solve initial value problems using the Laplace transform now. So let's do that. This is our first example, keeping this in mind and these seven in mind. All right, so let's do this one. I wanna take the, or I want to solve the differential equation given by Say y double prime plus two y prime minus eight y equals negative two cosine of t plus nine sine of t. And we're told that y of zero, these are our initial conditions, 
y of zero is equal to two and y prime at zero is equal to nine. Now, this is a problem that we could solve using um, the method of undetermined coefficients to find our y sub p, because we've got a linear combination of a sine and a cosine function. Um, to solve the corresponding homogeneous problem, it's constant coefficient, so we would let y equal e to the m times t and solve for the values of m. And then we'd end up with some solution that has two arbitrary constants in it because it's a second order differential equation. In order to find the values of those arbitrary constants, um, we'll just use these two conditions. And that will be enough. We'll have two equations and two unknowns, uh, and we'll use those to solve for the unknowns, and then we can substitute those in and then get our result. That's one way of doing this. Rather than doing it that way, we're going to use the Laplace transform to solve this differential equation. And this is very nice. I think it's very nice. There's very little differentiation involved. It's just a, a bit of algebra. And algebra is no big deal. We can, all, we can all handle the algebra. So we'll start by letting the Laplace transform of little y equal big Y. That's just a personal pet peeve of mine. I always want to introduce my notation, tell people, tell the reader uh, what notation I'm using. And that I'm not just going to randomly start saying y of s without specifying what y of s is equal to. So the Laplace transform of little y is equal to big Y. And then we want to take the Laplace transform of the differential equation. Now this is just my personal notation. Doesn't actually mean anything. I don't think that anybody else uses it. It's just how I like to write it. Um, we want the Laplace transform of the left-hand side and that has to be equal to the Laplace transform of the right-hand side. Now the Laplace transform is a linear operator. So you can just take the Laplace transform of each term separately. So I have the Laplace transform of y double prime plus two times the Laplace transform of y prime minus eight times the Laplace transform of y equals negative two times the Laplace transform of cosine of t uh, plus nine times the Laplace transform of sine of t. And the Laplace transform of y double prime can be found using this rule. So this is the second derivative. So we're gonna start with an s squared. And then we'll have an, an s to the first term and an s to the zero term. So it has three terms for the second derivative. And then these guys get multiplied by the Laplace transform of y, which is capital Y of s or big Y of s. And then we have little y at zero minus y prime at zero. The orders of the derivative increase as you go from left to right. Okay, so that's what we have there. Then we're adding two times the Laplace transform of y. Don't forget your parentheses because this has multiple terms or this is y prime, the Laplace transform of y to the, or the first derivative of y um, is s to the first times um, the Laplace transform of y minus little y evaluated at zero. And then we've got minus eight here and the Laplace transform of y is capital Y of s. And this is equal to negative two times the Laplace transform of cosine, and it's cosine of t. So we're just applying this. Um, k is equal to one in this case. So we're gonna have an s over s squared plus one squared, which is just plus one. And then for sine, I have a nine up here. And the Laplace transform of sine of t, if k is equal to one, is k over s squared plus one squared, or k in this case is one. So it's gonna be one over s squared plus one. And we're multiplying that by a nine. So we've got nine over s squared plus one. Okay, so we took the Laplace transform of the differential equation, and then we've got some initial conditions here. Let me take care of that sun. It's coming in from the window. It's beautiful outside, but I don't want that in the video. There we go, sorry about that. Okay. And now I've got y of zero equals two and y prime of zero equals nine. So this is two, this is nine, and this is two. All right. And now we want to get y of s by itself.
That's the Laplace transform of the solution to this differential equation subject to these initial conditions. So I'll group my y of s terms. I've got s squared times y of s plus 2s times y of s minus 8 times y of s. So I'm grouping all of those together and I'm factoring out that y of s. And then everything else I just want to list here. So this is minus 2s minus 9. And then I have 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. And that equals this guy over here. And you could combine those. Actually, it may be helpful. I'm trying to get y of s by itself, so I will add these guys to the other side. So we'll have negative 2s plus 9 over s squared plus 9, or excuse me, s squared plus 1. And then we're adding 2s to both sides, and this is subtracting 13, so I'm going to add 13 to both sides. And then I want to get y of s by itself. So we're going to take that and divide by s squared plus 2s minus 8. Now, I could take this fraction and divide by that. But remember, dividing by a number is the same as multiplying by 1 over that number. So I think I'll just do this instead. I'll just put an s squared plus 2s minus 8 in that denominator because I'm multiplying by 1 over that. It eliminates that extra step of doing the algebra um, to divide by a fraction and multiply by the reciprocal and all that jazz. So this is re these two reduce. And now we've got y of s equals this. We've got negative 2s plus 9 all divided by s squared plus 1 times s squared plus 2s minus 8 plus 2s plus 13 over s squared plus 2s minus 8. Now, we don't have anything in our table of Laplace transforms um, that, that looks like this. But if we do a little bit more algebra, we should be able to get y of s by itself. So you might have to do partial fraction decomposition, and that involves either factoring this as much as possible, this 2s squared or s squared plus 2s minus 8, or um, if it doesn't factor, we might have to um, complete the square eventually. Um, we would think of it as an irreducible quadratic in that case. So the question becomes, okay, s squared plus 2s minus 8 doesn't factor. Are there two numbers that multiply to give us negative 8? that adds a two, and there sure are. Like this is the same as, what? If I add four and subtract two there, don't I get that? Four times negative two is negative eight, last times last. Outer times outer is negative two s, inner times inner is positive four s. Negative two s plus four s is positive two s. Great, so this is the same as, as this guy. So we're going to put that in the denominator over here as well. So that means we're really close. Now we just have to do partial fractions for this one and partial fractions for this one. Now some students will get a common denominator for the whole thing and just do partial fractions once. You can do that, um, but honestly, I wouldn't recommend it. I think that it's easier to just do the partial fractions with this little piece and partial fractions with this little piece um, and then be done with it. So that's what I would recommend. Um, if you do it the other way, the, the partial fractions just seems to get hairier. I would rather do two simple problems like that and it can get us to our answer pretty quickly um, as opposed to uh, doing it the other way, doing one large problem. But I guess you just sort of pick your poisons, whatever you want, would like to do. Okay, so this is that first fraction. Now that's an irreducible quadratic and both of these are linear factors that are not repeated. So I'll do the partial fractions for this. For the irreducible quadratic, we get um, a constant times our variable plus a constant. Now remember your, const your variable is S not X here.
Okay. Now for the linear factors, you just have a constant in the numerator for each of those. Now we're just trying to find the values of A and B and C and D that cause this fraction to equal the sum of these fractions. In order to find the values of A, B, C, and D, we'll multiply by the LCD, which is always the original denominator. I'm running out of space, sorry guys. This is supposed to be in the numerator even though it looks like it's in the denominator. It's just because of the way I, because of where I wrote PFD. It's in the numerator, okay. So after we do that, all the denominators should clear. If they don't, you have not chosen the least common denominator. Now, you always wanna choose the original denominator. Sometimes students make the mistake of just multiplying all the denominators together. That will always give you a common denominator, but it won't necessarily be the least common denominator. In this case, it would be the least common denominator, but, but sometimes it won't. So I don't recommend that. I always say the original denominator is always the LCD. So those factors should all cancel. All the factors in the denominator should cancel if you've chosen the, or a common denominator. And this S minus two reduces with that one. So we have this. So you have negative two S plus nine is equal to A S plus B times S plus four times S minus two plus C times S squared plus one times S minus two plus D times S squared plus one times S plus four. And now we just wanna choose values of S that cause these factors to be zero. Now I've got this factor, it's a linear factor and that one is a linear factor. So those are pretty easy to handle. The value of S that would cause this to be zero would be, well, S squared would have to be negative one. So S would have to be plus or minus I, but we're not thinking of S as a complex number here, even though we could. So rather than doing that, um, we'll do something else. We'll choose a different value of S in order to um, help us get closer to finding all four of our constants. But let's see what we can find by setting the linear factors equal to zero. So if we set um, S plus four equal to zero and solve for S, we'll get S equals negative four. We wanna substitute that into both sides of the equation. Negative four times negative two is eight. Eight plus nine is 17. And if S is equal to negative four, this guy is gone and this guy is gone. So I would have uh, C times uh, negative four squared is 16. 16 plus one is 17. Hey, that's nice. Get a common factor of 17 on both sides. It's gonna divide out nicely. And then if S is negative four, negative four minus two is negative six. So when we solve for C, we're gonna divide both sides by this and we're gonna get C equals negative one sixth. All right, cool. Uh, let's set another factor equal to zero. We've got S minus two here. That's equal to zero and S is equal to two. So when S is equal to two, this side becomes a negative two times two, which is negative four. Negative four plus nine is five. And if S is equal to two, I've got this times zero, so that's gone. And then if S is equal to two, this, this is this times zero, so that's gone. The only part that's not gone is what we have over here. Well, if S equals two, we've got uh, two squared plus one is five. So this is D times five. And two plus four over here would give me a six. And the fives are gonna reduce when we solve for D. So D is gonna be positive one sixth. Great. So we had one, two, or one, two, three, four constants we're trying to solve for, and we've got two of them. Hmm. Now at this point, we have some options. If we're trying to find A and B, and we're choosing not to allow S to be I and negative I so that these guys cancel. Um, well, we can choose any other S um, that we want, um, any other real number S because we're assuming S is a real number for right now um, and substitute into the equation. And then our hope is that since we know C and D, um, that will be enough to get us um, some value 
for A and B, or maybe just an equation involving A and B, that might be nice. Um, so let's let S equal zero. And if you're asking yourself why zero, it's because this is really easy to evaluate at S equals zero. Anything's easy to evaluate um, at zero. Um, so I'd have uh, nine plus zero, which is of course nine. And then if S is zero, the A is gone here. And we just end up with a B times four times negative two. And then we'll have C and then I have S squared plus one, that's zero squared plus one is one times uh, zero minus two is negative two. So I have one times negative two, which is negative two plus D. And if S is zero, this is one and that's a four. Okay. And I already know uh, C and D, so I can substitute those in here and I can use that to solve for B, which is very nice. Um, so we have nine equals negative eight B and we're taking C and we're multiplying it by a negative two. Negative two times negative one sixth is positive two over six or one third. And then I am taking four and I'm multiplying it by one sixth. I have four over six, uh, which is two thirds. That's pretty nice. So I've got nine equals negative eight B plus one. Subtract one from both sides. And if we divide by negative eight, we get B equals negative one. All right, so we know A, or we know B, C, and D, and we need to find A. Okay, we wanna pick another value of S. It's really um, easy to evaluate this equation at. S equals zero and S equals one are probably the best way to go. Like what's easier than, or what's as easy as zero? Almost one. I've got nine minus two in this case, that's gonna be a seven. And if S is equal to one, we have A plus B here times five times negative one plus C. And if S is one, we've got one squared plus one, which is two. Uh, one minus two is negative one. And I have D and then I have, I have one squared plus one, which is two times five again. Okay, now we know what B is. B is negative one. So this is A minus one times negative five. And C is negative one six. So I have negative two times negative one six. So that's positive two over six, which is one third. And then I've got 10 here over six. Well, um, let's say two over six is gonna be one third. And then I'm taking one third and I'm multiplying it by five. So it's gonna be five thirds. Okay. And if we distribute that negative five, we get this. Um, one third plus five thirds is six thirds, which is two. Okay, so I've got uh, seven on this side and seven on that side, subtract the sevens. And it turns out A equals zero. Okay, cool. Um, so we've got our partial fraction decomposition for that first fraction. Remember, we're trying to find Y of S and it's right here. Um, so that first fraction this expression can be rewritten this way, where a is zero, uh, b is negative one, c is negative one sixth, and d is positive one sixth. Now the second expression was actually two uh, s plus thirteen over um, s plus four times s minus two. You can use partial fraction decomposition again if you want to. Yes, I think that's the option that I want to use in this case. So I've got two linear factors, they're not repeated. So I'll put a constant over the first linear factor. And then I'll add the constant over the second linear factor, that'll work. And we multiply by the LCD. Now, if you have been doing this a while and you kind of already know what will happen when you multiply by the LCD, you can skip this step. If you watch YouTube videos online, many people skip this step. But I wouldn't recommend skipping this step unless you know where that equation comes from. Some students are like, why did they magically become, go from this equation to this other equation? It's because they multiplied by the LCD and they simplified. So if you can't see how they're deciding which factors to keep over here, just multiply by the LCD and you'll see that's why they have the A times the S minus two and the b times the s plus four. It's because the s plus four is reduced here and the s minus two is reduced there. Okay, so after we multiply by the LCD and simplify, we get this. 
And this is very nice. You can solve for A and B pretty easily just by letting S or choosing values of S that cause each of these factors to be zero. So let's let S equal two. Then we'll have um, two times two is four. Uh, four plus 13 is 17. And if S is equal to two, we have uh, zero times A here, so that's zero. And then we've got B times six. So B in this case, it's a different value of B than the other B, is gonna be 17 over six. And if S is equal to negative four, that factor would be zero. So I'd have uh, negative four times two is negative eight. Uh, negative eight plus 13 is five. And if S is negative four, this guy is B times zero, so we get zero. And this is gonna be A times a negative four minus two, which is negative six. So A is negative five over six. Okay, and that is our um, partial fraction decomposition for that second term. So Y of S can be written this way. That first partial fraction decomposition was this. Now A was zero and B was negative one. So I'm gonna have negative one over S squared plus one plus C over S plus four. C is negative one sixth. plus D over S minus two. And D is positive one sixth. That's from the first partial fraction decomposition. And from the, from the second one, we have A over S plus four, where A is negative five over six. And then we have a B, which is 17 over six, over S minus two. Now we can combine these. Uh, I've got like terms here and here. It's negative five or negative five over six minus one over six is negative six over six, which is a negative one. And then I've got one sixth and 17 six. So that's gonna be 18 six, which is three. Oh, and that's very nice. I've got an entry in the table for that and that and that. So little y of t is just the inverse transform of this. And remember how inverse transforms work. It's an integral operator. So if you have a constant, you can pull that out and then take the Laplace or inverse Laplace transform of that term. Well, in this case, K is equal to one. And this is the form for K over S squared plus K squared. Like it has that form of K equals one. Um, so the inverse Laplace transform of K over S squared plus K squared, K equals one, is sine of KT of K equals one. So it's gonna be sine of one T. Then we're subtracting what we have right here. Um, and this matches the form one over S minus A, where A is negative four. And this matches the form one over S minus A times a three, where A is equal to two. The inverse Laplace transform of one over S minus A is E to the A T. So this is going to be E to the negative four T when we take the inverse transform. And then we'll bring the three down and the inverse transform of one over S minus two is E to the two T. That's Y of T. And sometimes it's hard to remember what it was we were doing. Let's go back. We're solving a differential equation guys. That is the function that satisfies this differential equation and these initial conditions. So now that we know the Laplace trans transform, once we're familiar with the Laplace transformation, this operator and the inverse Laplace transformation operator, we are able to solve this um, differential equation subject to these initial conditions relatively simply just by turning this differential equation problem into an algebra problem. So we don't have to solve the corresponding homogeneous equation and then the non-homogeneous equation and get your y sub p and get y sub c plus y sub p and then you've got this c1 and c2 in it, the two constants and you use this and this to get c1 and c2. Rather than doing that, we just take the Laplace transform of the differential equation, you end up with some algebraic equation in y, y of s, get y of s by itself, and then you do a little bit of algebra so that you can take the inverse transform of y of s. That little bit of algebra ended up being partial fraction decomposition, which we had to do twice. And then once we did that, 
that was very nice. We ended up with three terms that all happened to be in our table of Laplace transforms and all house also happened to be um, on our short list of Laplace transforms that we, we use so often that we tend to commit them to memory, even though they're on our table if we want them and we, we you know, sometimes having the table makes us feel a little bit better. It's like our safety net, right? Um, so these are all on the table. It's easy to take the inverse transform using the fact that it is a linear operator. Pull out the constants and then just take the inverse transform of each piece and then get this. Now, if you want, you can show yourself, prove to yourself that when you plug in t equals zero here, you should get y equals two. So this is minus sine of zero, minus e to the zero. So sine of zero is zero, e to the zero is one, so this is gonna be negative one, plus three times e to the zero. So we're gonna have negative one plus three, which is two, that's y of t or that's a y of zero. And we had y of zero is equal to two. Now I'm not going to do this right now, but if I wanted to, I could compute y prime, plug in t equals zero and show that I get nine. And if I wanted to, I could take the derivative twice and substitute into this differential equation and plug in my um, function y and simplify it. And I bet I'd get this negative two cosine of t plus nine sine of t, provided that I didn't make any mistakes anywhere. Okay, so that is how we solve a differential equation um, with constant coefficients using the Laplace transform uh, formation. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you, since this is a second order differential equation and the corresponding homogeneous equation has constant coefficients, the coefficient of Y of S is the um, characteristic polynomial for that homogeneous uh, differential equation. So remember, if we let, if this was equal to zero, we would let y equal e to the m times t, take the derivative twice, substitute, factor out the e to the mt, and we get up this polynomial in m equals zero. That polynomial would have been m squared plus 2m minus 8. So we see that that same polynomial here, just evaluated at s, that will always be the case when the corresponding homogeneous equation has constant coefficients. If it doesn't, that doesn't hold. Um, then there's something else that we have to do. Uh, but I just want you to be aware that if you see the coefficients of one and two and uh, negative eight here for a second order equation, I expect um, a one S squared plus a two S a minus eight there as the coefficient of Y of S. If you don't get that, something went wrong. Um, now, another thing that I want you to uh, be aware of is if you have multiple terms well, if you're taking the Laplace transform of y, y double prime or y prime and you've got a coefficient out front, remember that coefficient multiplies all of the Laplace transform of that derivative. And the derivatives always have multiple terms in their Laplace transforms. So I was sure to add parentheses here. One mistake that students often make in differential equations is they forget to put those parentheses there and because they forget to put the parentheses there, rather than having a minus four, they have a minus two. They forget to distribute that two to this negative two to get the, the right coefficient here. And it's not that bad, it's not that big a deal. Um, you'd still probably get most of the credit on a problem like this if you forgot those parentheses and you had a, a negative two instead of a negative four. But if you're trying to get the right answer, if you want, if you want to be correct, if you want to be accurate, make sure you include those parentheses and then distribute through the parentheses. Um, then you will get the correct solution of the differential equation. Also in that case, the coefficients would tend to be nicer. So this is a very nice one. The coefficients are only three, negative one and negative one. If we accidentally made a mistake here, there's no guarantees that those fractions or those coefficients would be so nice. Um, so that's how we do that. I'll see you in the next video. We'll do another problem like this. Um, and then we will learn um, more methods for differential equations. We'll look at the shifting theorems um, next.